Welcome everyone to uh, to our talk on the generative AI payoff in 2024 for enterprises. Uh, I'm Naveen Rao, and uh, I'll be introducing the topic um, here going forward. We have a lot of great great content towards the end as well, so please stay tuned. So, introduction: We're going to talk a little bit about some of the problems that we see. Generative AI is brand new, and we see that there's uh, a lot of excitement. But the reality is when we start deploying these things in an enterprise context, there are lots of different things we have to think about. Consumer is one thing, enterprise has many different needs around accuracy and other things. So I'm gonna show you a few examples of where, where current techniques break down. And then later on, we're gonna show you uh, how we start addressing those with some product announcements. So there's a few things here that uh, have never been announced before. We're gonna be seeing, you're gonna be seeing a lot more from us over the next coming months. And also, we've already previewed some of this stuff with some of our customers like ADP, and uh, they're going to be here talking about their experience as well. All right. As I mentioned, my name is Naveen Rao. I was previously the CEO of Mosaic ML, which was acquired by Databricks uh, just about eight months ago. Um, in that time, we've been working pretty feverishly on integrating our products into a better experience overall into Databricks and you know, really leveraging the tools of Databricks to, to build something that... Uh, no one else has and solve some real needs for, for the enterprise. So as I mentioned, Gen AI is, is a big topic these days. Every board seems to have um, you know, uh, a mandate, start implementing Gen AI in our products, in our workflows, you know, in, our, in our operational processes. So everybody has something, 91% of, uh, of companies are doing this. And 75% of CEOs are saying that they have to, they have to use Gen AI to get, gain a competitive advantage. But what are some of the problems here? So, you know, you may have heard of the end of humanity and all of this kind of stuff. It's gotten a lot of uh, headlines, but really that's not the problems that we have today at hand. Um, we have things that are much more uh, near term and that we need to solve. And they're really technology problems that can be solved. We believe if we solve these things, we can actually start to realize some of these, uh, some of these gains where, you know, human, a lot of uh, uh, knowledge work can be, can be automated and augment humans to do more with less. Here's a great example that we found uh, just recently. This is a Chevy dealership, a Chevrolet dealership selling trucks, and they put up a chat bot that could answer uh, customer questions and guide, their, guide them to the right products. What's interesting about this is that it actually pulled up the Ford F-150, which is one of their main competitors, um, as a recommendation. Clearly, that's something that we don't want. If you're an enterprise, you have to be able to control this kind of behavior. This is not appropriate to start talking about competitors, products as a recommendation. So this thing is really lacking enterprise context. And you know, for applications in the enterprise, things that are driving you know, customer acquisition or reducing customer churn, that kind of a thing, accuracy is super important. You have to be correct in what you say. And that was an example of kind of accuracy being off. In addition to that, we have to have safety. We can't have uh, models that are actually saying things that are uh, unsafe to a business, but also unsafe to people. I mean, if you're talking to a car dealership and you start trying to take the chat pot down a different direction, it should stop you. So these are kind of these roadblocks and guardrails that we need to put in, in place to make sure that these applications can actually be deployed. And then governance is we need to make sure that the data that's being uh, output by the LLM is actually meant for that user. Um, perhaps somebody could have different tiers where certain information is, uh, is appropriate for certain users, but all of that needs to be built in the back end. We need to actually have real access control and governance around the data that these, these models can serve. So there's a big challenge here where everybody's trying Gen AI, they're, they're doing POCs in the enterprise, but 90% of enterprises are not really confident in going to production. And it's because of these reasons we just discussed. They're not accurate enough. We can't trust them. Um, I can't say that they're really going to be helpful to my business if they're doing things like recommending uh, competitors' products. Here's another few examples. So at Databricks, all of the employees are called Bricksters. This is just a, a term that we use internally. But it's not a term that you probably would see on the internet so much. So if you ask GPT-4 here, uh, a Brickster is a character from a Lego Island video game. It doesn't have the semantics of understanding what that means when a, someone at Databricks asks this question. So that's lacking, lacking uh, semantics and context. There was yet another uh, um, 
hallucination that caused some issues with Air Canada just recently. They, uh, the, the chatbot offered a refund to a customer when it shouldn't have. And now the airline is having to actually, you know, do this. And so I think this is the problem is that when you make these bots um, actually be able to present information and make choices, they have to be accurate. And I think this hallucination actually costs this company money. Imagine if this is happening at scale, if there are millions of such customers that could really impact the bottom line of a company. And this one is, uh, is kind of another, another chat bot that's, uh, uh, with a car dealership. It's another Chevrolet dealership, but it actually offered a Chevy Tahoe, you know, a large SUV for $1. And it said, here's a legally binding offer. If, if something from a company says that on their website, it kind of has to be legally binding. So we can't have these sorts of things coming out. You can't have humans checking every one of these conversations. It's just too much work. And here's actually a kind of a, an amusing one. If you've ever used a chatbot, um, you know, OpenAI or our chatbots or any others, you would see that um, sometimes they say they apologize. I can't do this task. Well, we need to catch that before it goes live on a website. So in this particular instance, these are uh, product descriptions that were meant to come out of, a, of, a, of an LLM, a large language model. Um, and they probably have some sort of input that was supposed to drive a useful, maybe, maybe even customized output as a description here. But clearly there was something wrong and it says, I cannot fulfill this request. Somebody needs to filter that. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you can't just put the raw content out there. And finally, uh, governance is about, you know, not driving information that uh, outward that should not be presented to that user. So Hanlon is our CTO of AI and Matea is our CTO of Databricks. And, you know, if Hanlon's asking a question about a phone plan saying it's too expensive, you can't then offer up Matei's plan and say, this is Matei's plan that violates privacy. So we need to have governance on these things. So it's, you know, everyone's very excited about the capabilities and their capabilities are amazing. But at the same time, we have to make sure that we don't violate um, uh, the, the standard rules that we set forth. These are not new problems. They're just new problems in the world of generative AI. So really for application quality for enterprises is that we need accuracy, safety, and governance but we really need that customized on customer data. Uh, the initial way to do that was really prompt engineering or putting information into the prompt. We call this augmented generation where I can put uh, enterprise context within the prompt. That does work, uh, but it doesn't work perfectly. It doesn't work for every situation. And that's the kind of tool that we offer here at Databricks. So th three unique things about us and generative AI specifically are we get you to production quality. Production quality is all of these things. It's the guardrails. It's the um, you know the way the, the wording comes out. All of that needs to be controlled and customized for a particular customer. If you're a car dealership talking to car buyers, it's very different than uh, a bank talking to banking customers, for instance. So these are different sorts of outputs. They have different flavors of language use and all of that needs to be customized. And we need complete ownership over these things. As we start to customize models and their behavior, uh, and the outputs of the whole system, that's actually an IP creation event. Building something that actually services my customers better than my competition is a competitive advantage. It actually makes the company pretend, potentially be able to have greater sales or less turnover or, or some other way of increasing revenue. So that is IP creation in and of itself. So you know, giving that to another uh, company may not be the right, the right decision. And all of this stuff is done with the lowest possible cost, doing it with the most efficiency possible. At Mosaic, one of the things we really did up front was address the, the problem of growing cost and making sure that we use compute most effectively. We could train a model with the least possible amount of compute and also serve that model with the least possible amount of compute. And so we've now crafted this whole platform into something that we believe leads us to maximizing generative AI quality. This is not something other people say. It's not about entertainment. It's about quality of output. A token or a word uh, is, is, and is, is in and of itself not very important unless it has a lot of meaning around it. That's what we mean by quality. Get the best possible words out there. Um, you know, you, you can kind of equate this to, I can watch a lot of bad content on YouTube, but there's only a few different, a few different uh, pieces of content that are really important on YouTube. And it's the same kind of thing with, produced content or produced text that come out of these LLMs, the quality is extremely important. And that quality means something different for every context and every company that rolls it out. 
So optimizing app quality is not simple. There's a lot that goes into it. Part of it is the model itself. We've talked about this um, in, in other places and the whole industry has gotten very excited around companies that can build great models. And so that is where things start. But then actually tuning that model for the particular enterprise and the particular domain it can be very important. And then actually inserting into the prompt the right information to answer the questions is also very important. That's through a vector DB and uh, uh, an embedding model that pulls the right stuff into that approximate match of the vector DB. We'll get into details in a moment. All of these things can work in concert, by the way. I can fine tune a model uh, on a domain. I can adapt it to that domain. And then I can use a vector database with an embedding model to actually get better results. So all of these things work together. This is not one thing. And then outside of the, the main pipeline, we have the UI, of course, how we actually consume the content. And then we have um, uh, monitoring of that content, you know, making sure there is no PII, actually maybe doing some post-generation filtering. And then all of this lives within uh, the confines of, of Unity Catalog, where we have a governance structure with access control on top of it. And so overall, Databricks is the best place to build customized Gen AI. And this is extremely important for enterprise as we've, as we've just noted. So bringing the best possible model from, uh, building the best possible model from scratch, if a customer has a lot of data, is called pre-training. Then tuning that model to behave the way it needs to in a particular context, we can call that fine tuning or, or adaptation. And then using things like retrieval augmented generation to bring in the right content to actually make that LLM produce the right outputs for the business. So complete ownership and control of the model is something that we kind of uniquely have. If you go to any other provider, even though they may do fine tuning, they don't actually give you the weights of the model. We not only fine tune the model using our tools, we usually, we do so on open source models. Those models, that, that resultant model after fine tuning is yours. That is your IP. Creating that model, those weights are your weights. And so I think this is actually very important, not just for IP ownership, but also for data security. When a model is tuned or, or pre-trained on data, it can actually memorize that data. So if you don't know where the model weights went, you actually don't know where your data went. There is a potential for leakage here because they can verbatim spit out data that they were, spit, that they were trained on. So that's very important to, to maintain control of the model weights over time. So that's maintain differentiation and control and privacy. So we actually enable all of these different parts of the stack as we've, as we've talked about, starting with prompt engineering. That's the simplest thing you can do. We're building tools to make that easier for your business. And in fact, you know, we, we start seeing patterns across different verticals that we can kind of give people great starting points here. It's like this model with that prompt engineering works really well. The next level tends to be, hey, I have a whole bunch of documents and Databricks. I want to now combine that with my LLM and generate some outputs. Call that retrieval augmented generation. That needs a vector database. We have these components. And now we've put together some patterns that make it very easy to use. And you're going to see a demo of this uh, shortly. The next level is then fine tuning a model for your particular domain and adapting it to that. Again, you can use this with RAG, with prompt engineering. All of these techniques work together. And finally, for the most advanced users is full pre-training. This is actually taking a model that's been, uh, that's completely from scratch, taking you know lots of data, like a trillion words, and actually training a model completely, for, completely from scratch for a particular purpose. We actually see a lot of customers doing this who have already gone through the pain of gathering these data sets and, uh, and want to create something truly unique. One such example of pre-training is Replit. Uh, Replit is a shared IDE where developers can actually co-develop uh, applications and write code together, even though they're remote. It's actually quite a, quite a cool tool. And what they want to do is build something that does code completion, you know, code generation, code checking in real time in the IDE. The, since it's a shared IDE environment, everything is live. And uh, one thing that was very important to them was latency. So the way to reduce latency is to actually make a smaller model. They don't need that model to be very good at you know, world history or something like that. They really need it to be great at, um, at coding. And so they have a ton of data from their users that they could use to actually train a model. They built a model from scratch with us, 2.7 billion parameter model. They actually open sourced it. They did it in three days. And basically a very small team there, two people, three days, uh, 
a lot of great data from their platform and they were able to get a model out that was state of the art. So it's a pretty cool success story. And, you know, company like Replit, they're, they're a startup, they're growing very fast and cost is very important to them. They can't spend millions of dollars on these kinds of things. And so they came to us to help them do this in the most cost, cost effective way as possible. So this is one of the things we prided ourselves on from the start was um, we started talking about Mosaic's law, which was every year a, a neural network that has a certain capability will be will will continue to decrease in cost of training by a factor of four. And we're actually starting to see that. Um, this was an example of stable diffusion training. It's actually more than a factor of four. We went, it was something like 600K that was advertised in 2022 by other folks. We brought it down to 160K in 2023, and now it's you know below 50K. I think it's even lower than this now. Keeps coming down as we get better at optimization, better algorithmic methods, you know, all kinds of tweaks to the whole um, uh, learning and training pipeline. And with LLMs, we saw something very similar. We saw in 2022, at the end of 2022, I think in uh, October, it was about $450,000 to train a GPT-3 level model. That's now something on the order of 70, 75K. So this keeps coming down. It makes everything more accessible. And we are starting to see many more applications incorporate custom LLMs. Uh, 